The South Carolina Gamecocks with the first conference win of the SEC season over Vandy, 13 to 10 in dramatic fashion. We bring in a Will Gunter from 107.5 The Game. His show is the all-new early game on 107.5 there in Columbia. Will, how's it going, man? Great. We got college football this weekend, so we, are, we had it last uh, this past weekend. So uh, the world all is right with the world again. Feels great to actually be able to discuss and not uh, not predict what's going to happen, but be able to discuss what happened. Exactly. Believe it. We finally get to watch football. And then that was so fun over the weekend. We had so many great games across the national map. And it's got to be kind of good for you to be able to focus on your team on Thursday night. You get the W, so you got it in your back pocket. Then you're able to really kick back and watch some of the better teams in the country go at it on Saturday. That must have been fun. No, it was great. I actually ended up coming back from Nashville Saturday uh, morning. I left about uh, 8.30 Eastern time and got back, so I missed the early games. But, no, it's always fun to enjoy a Saturday on the couch, uh, picking out a couple different um, uh, menu items, whether it's chicken tenders or pizza or grilling out, and uh, enjoy some great football. And that's what we've had all weekend. It's been enjoyable to uh, to be able to watch it. Some of them have been really, really good games, too. So that something living up to the hype uh georgia north carolina was a lot of fun obviously notre dame texas right now probably the game of the weekend so you've had some games that have actually lived up to the hype which has been fun so for me will vandy was the better football team for most of the first half but uh, south carolina obviously did not let the game get away uh the defense was pretty sound but was getting beat up uh, by the vandy rushing attack there in the first half to a certain extent again not big plays but getting out physical up front. Uh, was that pretty much your assessment at that point? I, I think it's hard, uh, you know, one game sample size. Look, South Carolina's defense the last two years has been rated among the worst nationally. Um, so having to watch them for the last 25 games, I thought it was a, a pretty big improvement. Um, you know, the thing that I took away from Vanderbilt was Blossom game. The second running back, as crazy as it sounds, may have been better than Ralph Webb, a bigger kid. I thought he did more damage to South Carolina when he was in there. He's about 6'2", 235. And his physical presence, I thought, had an effect on the South Carolina defense, whereas Ralph Webb, about 5'10", 200 pounds, um, it took him a little while to get going. I know he finished with right around 95 yards for the game, but it was Blossom game that I thought had the biggest effect. For South Carolina, I thought it was it was a lot of pregame jitters and trying to figure things out and you go back I think in the first nine offensive plays, there was something like four penalties, three drops, uh, and a fumble. It was a very, very weird game, and it helped it in the first half. Vanderbilt's offensive time of possession was a little over 19 minutes to South Carolina's 11. Yeah, I didn't mean to start on a downer. You won the football game, but it, it just appeared to me as though Vandy was the better team early. But uh, and, and usually when a football team's able to come out and establish the run and beat down the other team early, that continues and pays dividends in the third and fourth quarter. But the South Carolina D defense, to its credit, played well against the run late, got a pass rush against Shermer, and, and the, you got to be happy with holding a team on the road to 10 points. I think that was the big thing, you're right, was being able to hold South Carolina, uh, keeping Vanderbilt at bay early on. But quite honestly, the, the way that game was playing out, South Carolina fumbles the punt. There was a fumbled punt there that led to three points. And then Vanderbilt had one drive, and they really didn't ever threaten a lot. South Carolina actually had the ball on their side of the field for the majority of the first half. Uh, Brandon McElwain had a fumble. South Carolina couldn't convert uh, one time on about a third and five, third and six. There was another play where McElwain ran and may or may not have fumbled. I thought it was missed opportunities for the South Carolina offense early on that probably made a difference in the direction of that ball game in the first half. And Vanderbilt's offense wasn't exactly doing too much. They had that one good drive, about 60 yards, that led to the touchdown. Other than that, South Carolina was being able to keep Vanderbilt in check. Yeah, the, the statistics bear it out. Uh, Vandy didn't do a whole lot on offense, and uh, their offense is probably going to struggle this year. But South Carolina did what it needed to do after – uh, taking a few hits uh, in, in that first quarter. So if we look at the offense, to me, Perry Orth was one of the keys to the victory. He comes in, makes some key throws. Obviously, he got the start, but Brandon McElwain came in and got a lot of snaps there in the first half. But once Orth was in there, that was the guy that obviously showed that he could deliver the ball downfield and, and take some pressure off the running game. You know, I, I think it gets lost in what happened last year. I don't think Perry Orth is going to win – um, the SEC East as a quarterback. I'm not sure he can go out by himself and lead a team to victory 
Uh, kind of like, say, an awful example, but let's say Tom Brady, who has average wide receivers, he makes them look better. Perry Orth needs other guys around him to step up. But if you go back last season when they were three and nine, there are highlights of him making some really, really good throws. He They didn't go three and nine last year. South Carolina didn't go three and nine because of quarterback play. Um, there was defensive deficiencies, Spurrier stepped down midseason. There were a lot of issues that South Carolina had outside of the quarterback position. So going in, I thought Perry Orth was the best option to begin with. And so with that being said, South Carolina relied on him in the second half. He finishes 11 of 19 for 152 yards. And that was the biggest difference, I thought, from the first half. Second, Even in the first half when Perry Orth played, Mark, there were some drop passes that really cost the Gamecocks an opportunity in that first quarter to get the ball moving. Yeah, and that's the deal. You you nailed it when it comes to the wide receiver situation when we had John just a few days before the game. Dropped passes. Every time I saw a drop out of a South Carolina receiver, I was like, well, that's what Will said was going to happen, and that's what he's seen in practice. But Brian Edwards was impressive. He made a couple really nice hands catches, one against the sideline on the right sideline when the Gamecocks were buried inside their own 10-yard line, and it didn't turn into points, but it flipped the field in the fourth quarter, and I thought it was uh, very pivotal. I think uh, South Carolina was down 10-3 to at the time, made like a 50-yard reception where he had to twist and turn and make a hands catch along the sideline. It flipped the field and ultimately put South Carolina in position to drive it for the game-tying score. Uh, and that was a good pass by Orth. And a matter of fact, a few plays later, they hit another deep pass to Debo Samuel that, that was a very good pass. Brian Edwards, eight catches. You're right, goes over 100 yards. Excellent first game from him. I, I thought the thing with Brian Edwards, we knew he had the potential to step up, but how quickly he found a rhythm in the second half that allowed him to be the go-to guy. He's 6'3", he's about 210, but this was a big recruit. This was a guy who had offers from a lot of schools, Georgia, Clemson, a lot of the big-name schools wanted him to come play at, at their university. He elected to stay with the University of South Carolina. And so what ends up happening, he steps in as some true freshman can do and makes an impact in the first game. And there's no doubt without Brian Edwards, South Carolina doesn't beat Vanderbilt. So was this uh, Perry Orth's uh, team as a quarterback, and is it uh, actually A.J. Turner's team from a running game situation based on what we saw in the first game, David Williams, uh, a lesser role carrying the football? South Carolina's got problems at running back, and I don't know. I'm not uh, – A.J. Turner is a smaller guy, but I think he can – it's not an issue of, of whether or not he can stay healthy. It's just the, it's the SEC. you got to go through 11 more games. You name me a team, even Leonard Fournette last year, you know, you name me a team who can play 11 games with one running back, and South Carolina, quite frankly, does not have a running back outside of, of A.J. Turner. David Williams has yet to show me anything. He was able to throw a block. If, if you want to highlight something that was positive on the Debo Samuel touchdown run. But outside of that, um, South Carolina, that's going to be the biggest issue for the Gamecocks moving forward is finding a second running back. We expected to see a Mississippi State team coming off an opening win against South Alabama. According to one of the power indexes, that was the biggest upset in college football in five years. The Jaguars had a 2% chance of winning. They pull it off at Scott Field against Mississippi State. Now, you guys go in there. And uh, maybe it's a toss-up game. Who, who knows? Mississippi State, a formidable team in regards to talent, but obviously lost a ton, starting with Dak Prescott from uh, 2015. Vegas doesn't see it that way. Have you seen the opening line there? Uh, Mississippi State comes out as a – you want to guess? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess uh, eight and a half. You're pretty good at that. Nine and a half. Okay. Nine and a half was the, uh, the, the Bulldogs' opening line. They were a favorite by nine and a half. It's actually been bet down. The last I saw about an hour ago to six and a half. And so uh, that that's changed a little bit. You know, the Mississippi State team is a team that during the offseason, I continuously talked about that their quarterback situation may actually be worse than South Carolina's with Nick Fitzgerald and Damian Williams, Elijah Staley's there. They were really looking for somebody. And I think that bared fruit on Saturday afternoon. They were up, though. Let's not forget the same thing to be said with Kentucky. Everybody wants to talk about these teams. Look, Kentucky was up 35 to 10. Well, Mississippi State was up 20. They were up 17 to nothing and then 20 to seven, and they end up blowing the game. Uh, there's no doubt that a lot of talent has left Starkville over the last two years, namely Dak Prescott, who's going to get a shot with the Cowboys now. Jeffrey Simmons will be back this week. Obviously, he's a controversial figure. Leo Lewis was very good for them last week, a former five star recruit, and is a guy that you got to watch. Um, to me, 
the biggest thing in this game, South Carolina's still inexperienced. There's still like one game, 60 minutes of football doesn't give you a ton of experience. You're going to go into Starkville, a team with their back against the wall. The Cowbells are going to be playing it. It's a night game. It's a different environment. I mean, Mark, you saw, or I'm guessing you saw on television, it was 50-50 at worst. It was 60-40 Vandy fans to South Carolina on Thursday night. That was not a road environment. I chuckled when I saw Will Muschamp mention it being a hostile environment. Anything but. It won't be that way in Starkville. It's a loud place to play. They've still got that stadium redesigned. It's taken effect and it makes it a better stadium. That, to me, is Saturday night in Starkville. Backs against the wall. These are two pretty even teams now. I mean, South Carolina can go and win that game. They're two pretty even teams. But the, being on the road at night with a team with its back pressed up against the wall is going to make it extremely difficult. Damian Williams is a guy that we saw play as a freshman for Mississippi State, a quarterback before Prescott uh, – took over and it was kind of between the Russell and the Prescott regimes there at Mississippi State hit 20 of 28 against South Alabama and really hit him up on the ground for almost 100 yards uh, in leading the Bulldogs offense though a 21-20 loss to the Jags all right getting a set on South Carolina it's Will Gunter from 107.5 the game his show is the all-new early game on 107.5 Will, it's always a good time. We appreciate you stopping by. I know you're running around 100 miles an hour for you to give us uh, 10 minutes is uh, good stuff. So thank you so much. I always appreciate doing it, and I look forward to talking throughout the season. We'll see where it goes. Fun first weekend. Fully expect it to continue.